Woodland period in the eastern United States was followed by the Mississippian period, which was characterized by the emergence of greater levels of social inequality. And we'll explore how and why the social inequality emerged and how it was expressed, particularly in the transformation of the uses of mounds. This lecture gives an introduction to Mississippian and talks about this emergence of social inequality, and there are three other lectures for Mississippian. The next one looks at the reading by John Blitz and Patrick Livingood about why some mounds were bigger than others. The third looks at a specific burial mound at the site of Cahokia in southern Illinois and uses it as an example of how power was expressed through mortuary ritual associated with these mounds. And the final one looks at Mississippian religion and the role of warfare in Mississippian society. Like during the earlier woodland period, there were several regional variants of Mississippian culture across the eastern United States. These regional variants differed in the local forms of pottery that was produced, how they made projectile points, and other material culture objects like their houses, and some variation in the way the dead were treated. However, like the earlier woodland groups, these Mississippian groups were unified by certain shared beliefs and ritual practices, and particularly a certain type of ritual iconography, art that expressed ideas about the nature of the universe and the supernatural powers that lived within it. In the final lecture, we'll look more closely at these artistic forms called the Southeastern Ceremonial Complex. The transition from the Woodland period to the Mississippian period is marked by the adoption of maize agriculture, and as soon as maize was introduced to the eastern United States from Mesoamerica, it largely replaced those small seeded indigenous domesticates that had been cultivated by earlier Woodland peoples. Maize first appeared perhaps as early as 100 BC in the eastern United States, first appearing in Florida and it seems that maize was introduced via the Caribbean from northern South America rather than northwards through Mexico and across the Great Plains. A distinctive form of processing dried maize kernels using a wooden mortar and pestle was found throughout the eastern United States, also throughout the Caribbean, and in northern South America. This is very distinctive from a tradition of using ground stone tools uh, to process maize that is found in Mexico and into the United States Southwest. While maize was introduced perhaps as early as 100 BC, it did not become widespread throughout the eastern part of the U.S. until about AD 400, and even then it did not become the primary staple crop until around AD 800. So it takes several hundred years before the cultivation of maize is fully adopted and becomes the dominant means of producing food. Maize is much more productive per acre than the earlier indigenous domesticates that were cultivated, so maize allowed larger food surpluses to be produced and accumulated, and it allowed a growing population to be fed. The production of surpluses allowed certain segments of the population to be freed from agricultural tasks and to perform instead other productive tasks or managerial roles. So you have the possibility of the emergence of full-time specialization in things other than just producing food. People who are producing certain craft objects, particularly pottery, or textiles, or baskets, or those who are performing particular political religious, or military roles. With growing populations fueled by the increased productivity of maize agriculture, we see a shift from the small dispersed homesteads of the woodland period into large, densely inhabited villages. And in this map of an excavated portion of a large Mississippian site in western Kentucky, you can see the dense arrangement of houses, the little squares. And the largest villages were centered on mounds, and were often surrounded by a stockade wall. In this map, there are no mounds, uh, but there is the stockade wall around the outermost portion of the village, and you can also see earlier stockade walls. The stockade walls had to be moved out in order 
to accommodate uh, the growing population at this site. This is an artist's reconstruction of one of these large Mississippian villages, uh, the site of Moundville in central Alabama, just north of Tuscaloosa, where the University of Alabama is. And now the University of Alabama runs the site as a state park, and it has a nice museum and trails, and you can walk up on top of several of the mounds. In the 1930s, uh, when a road was developed to allow access to visitors to the site, uh, there were extensive ed excavations at the site that uncovered hundreds of houses and thousands of burials. So you have a lot of detailed knowledge of the site. You can see the dense arrangement of houses both within and immediately outside the stockade, as well as an arrangement of mounds around a central plaza. The largest mound, the near foreground at the edge of the plaza, Mound A, was believed to be the support the residents of the chief, the leading member of the community. Other mounds along the plaza supported residences for other important people, perhaps leaders of different lineages or clans. And in the center of the plaza is a mound that supported a temple. Uh, this mound was oriented towards solstitial sunrise and sunset, uh, and is believed to have been a central point where religious rites integrating the entire community were held. This was at the center of a larger distribution of villages, this just the largest of them. Others were smaller, with fewer, or perhaps no mounds, uh, and many of the smaller villages also lacked the defensive fortifications around them. You may already recognize some evidence of social differentiation. Uh, the chief lives upon the tallest mound, looking down upon the rest of the community. There are other members of the community that similarly live in elevated positions, but there are also those who are living within the walls versus outside the walls. Uh, so there are several levels of distinction that also continue to the smaller sites outside of this. So we see the emergence of greater differentiation within the community, with some people having perhaps greater access to wealth and power than others. Houses during the Mississippian period are smaller than earlier woodland period houses. They're often referred to as wall trench houses because rather than excavating a individual hole for each post that was used to create uh, the walls of the house, they would dig a trench and then the posts would be set down in the trench and all the soil between them filled in. It's perhaps a little more labor efficient than the earlier excavation of individual post holes. But more importantly, does the reduction in the size of these houses indicate a change in the size of the basic social unit? A change from large extended families as cooperative social and economic units to smaller nuclear families. The houses were substantially smaller, almost one-sixth the size and it suggests that not only is there a reduction in the size of the social unit, but also some of the activities that formerly occurred within woodland houses occurred elsewhere within the Mississippian community. Perhaps in public spaces, courtyards surrounded by houses, or plazas surrounded by groups of these courtyards. The use of mounds during the Mississippian period was different than the way mounds were used during the earlier woodland period. Mounds continued to be used as mortuary facilities, places to entomb the dead, but they also came to be used as platforms that supported structures on top of them. Now, woodland mounds had associated structures, but these had existed before the mound was built. You had charnel houses that housed and stored and were used for the preparation and veneration of the remains of the dead prior to them being buried underneath the mound. In this case, however, the mound is built in order to support a structure that is used either as a residence uh, for the ruling elite or as temples that were used to validate the social status of the political and ritual elite. Being elevated on top of the mound, there was restrictions on the access to these ritual facilities, suggesting they weren't open to the entire community, but only to a smaller segment of the ritual elite within the community. However, performances done on the mound top uh, may have been intended to be visible to the entire community, but still separated and segmented the community into those that were elevated above and performing rituals on the community's behalf versus the more passive assembled crowd. 
the mound as an axis mundi, a point of connection between this earth that we the living live upon and other dimensions of the universe, the upper worlds above and the lower worlds below, came to be monopolized by the elite rather than being something that was accessible to the entire community as we saw in the earlier woodland period. The use of mounds in the earlier woodland period brought the entire community together as equals, whereas during the Mississippian period they are used to elevate, literally elevate, a small segment of the community over the others. So some of the evidence of social inequality that we can observe in the archaeological record of the Mississippian are these differences in residence. The mound-top residences of the ruling elite elevated above their fellow community members. But then there's also other spatial distinctions. Those residences that are near mounds and may be associated with them either as kin or people who have a greater level of allegiance to the ruler on top of the mound. There are those residences that are without mounds, either within the community of mounds but not near them, or perhaps in smaller villages that don't have mounds. If you think back to the overview of Moundville, there are also those residences that are within protective features like the Palisade Wall, or outside of them, and perhaps more vulnerable to attack by enemies. There are also differential distributions of certain resources. Some subsistence goods, where more high-valued subsistence goods, are found closely associated with mounds and the residences on the mounds. High-value subsistence goods like deer and certain large fish. These high-value animals produce lots of meat that can be used to finance feasts that the chiefs may use in order to create social debts and obligations among their followers. There's also differential distribution of certain craft items and exotic materials. Certain finely made pottery is more closely associated with mound top residences or residences near mounds, and exotic materials like copper, mica, and certain other minerals are more closely associated with the mound top residences and the residences near mounds than those residences that aren't associated with mounds. Then there are differences in the ways that people are treated after death. You might have at the very top burial within a mound, burial of the ruling elite accompanied by ritual offerings of various artifacts made from rare exotic resources and sometimes accompanied by human sacrifices. There's also burial without any offerings, near or within a non-elite residential area. And at the sort of bottom of the social pyramid, perhaps, ritual disposal as one of these human sacrifices to accompany one of the ruling elite. This figure presents an analysis of the grave goods, the offerings found with burials at Moundville. During the 1930s, during the excavations related to the development of the park, and the construction of the road to access the park, 1,975 burials were excavated. Now, there's great variation in the types of objects that are or are not found associated with various burials. Archaeologist Vince Stepanidis from the University of North Carolina analyzed this data for his dissertation research, and he found that there were three distinct social segments that he could identify on the basis of differences in graze goods. Segment A, there at the top of the pyramid, 5.5% of the population. These were individuals that were buried in mounds or near cemeteries that were near mounds, and they had various fancy objects as offerings, copper axes, copper ear spools, stone discs, shell beads, copper gorgets. In the next strata, segment B, which were recovered from cemeteries near mounds, they still have some fancy offerings, but not quite as fancy. So they have various types of pottery vessels, objects made from animal bone or shell. 
but you do not have the fancy copper or objects that are made from rare resources like galena. And this segment constitutes about 13.8% of the population. At the base of the pyramid, comprising 80.7% of the population, are those that have very few or no grave goods. And if they do have grave goods, it's limited to ceramic vessels. There aren't fancy objects made out of rare resources. This vast majority who's buried with little or nothing can be found in cemeteries near mounds or cemeteries that are not associated with mounds. And often those that have no grave goods are associated with these areas not near mounds. So this can be seen as evidence of social stratification, the emergence of distinct social classes. You have an elite class, and then you have the commoners. And in Mississippian society, we had elites who were chiefs, who monopolized access to the supernatural through their claim on the mounds, their residences on them, and their exclusive use of the temples on top of them. And they would often claim descent from deities, here we have a diagram that shows the nature of political organization within the Natchez, a descendant culture of the Mississippian who were encountered by the French as they explored the lower Mississippi River in the early late 1600s and early 1700s. Their chief was called the Great Sun and was believed to be a direct descendant of the supernatural deity that created and moved the sun through the sky and they controlled politics through ritual, through this direct connection that they had to the supernatural, this descent that they had from powerful deities. And the great chief had his various um, relatives, brothers, cousins, others who had some line of descent from the supernatural, but not the direct line that the chief had, and they would be an elite that was associated with the chief and assisted him in the operation of the political economy that developed. He might have some of his brothers or cousins act as sub-chiefs and live in other communities that he has control over and ensure that his orders are followed and implemented. You have other levels of leaders, the heads of clans within the communities, uh, those who represent the interests and concerns of the commoners to the elite. But the vast majority of the population are these commoners most of whom are what we would call peasant farmers, the people who actually work the fields, producing the food that was needed to fuel this economy. And we see the development of what anthropologists refer to as a political economy, where the production and distribution of goods, both agricultural goods and craft goods, was used to reinforce uh, political institutions and authority, in this case the institution of the chief and his authority. And so he controlled the production of agricultural foods, and all the peasants had to pay a tithe to the chief, to pay tribute, to bring a portion of their production to him, where he stored it and then redistributed it through the community, either through financing public feasts, where he would repay uh, those within the community for their obedience and allegiance, or in times of need, the, king, the chief would have resources to distribute within the community. That village over there, all of their crops failed because of a locust swarm that ate all of their corn. Well, I am the chief, and I am your father, and I am here to provide for you. And it's a way that the chief created allegiance and dependence upon him. The largest Mississippian site, and based on the knowledge that we have today, perhaps the most important, and where a lot of the important religious and political ideas were initially developed, founded, and then spread through interaction to other communities, was the site of Cahokia in southern Illinois. It is really close to the Mississippi River, along a tributary to the Mississippi, Cahokia Creek, and it is almost directly across the Mississippi River from modern-day St. Louis. Looking at this artist's reconstruction of the site, it is very large and impressive, but it does not even show the entire extent of the site. The site stretched for about five miles along Cahokia Creek, 
and extended a mile across. The site is centered on the Grand Plaza, which was surrounded by a wooden stockade that had towers along it in very precise intervals. The stockade enclosed an area of 50 acres, and within the stockaded area you have the Grand Plaza in the center, which is a large, open, and artificially leveled and flattened area that is surrounded by a series of mounds. The largest mound, Monk's Mound, at the northern end of the site, is also the largest prehistoric structure in all of, the nor all of North America. 30 meters high and covering 14.4 acres at its base, Monk's Mound was the largest structure north of Mexico until the 1880s when taller skyscrapers were built in Chicago. And it wasn't until World War II when huge production facilities to build B-17 bombers were built that you had any single buildings that had a larger footprint than this structure. It is immense. In the foreground, you can see a four-lane divided highway with a car driving along it. It is incredibly large. You can also see puny little people at the top of the second stairway. It was built in 14 stages between A.D. 900 and 1250, ultimately creating a structure with multiple levels. And it supported several buildings on top including on its summit the largest Mississippian building ever excavated. These were likely temples that were used in rituals or performed for the bulk of the community, uh, but access to the mound top and access to the temples on top of the mound was probably limited uh, to a select few. Here's a Google Earth image showing the immense size of this structure. You can also see a few other mounds within the site, as well as modern developments, including Interstate 55, uh, just north of the site. The, the construction of Interstate 55 in the 1970s led to many excavations that revealed a lot of important information about the emergence of this site. And here I have dropped an outline of the size of Monk's Mound on top of the MCC campus. As you can see, it would cover much of campus. We started right outside the Cultural Sciences Building, where anthropology classes are held if you come in person. It would go north up to the open quad in front of the library, and then west to the new Student Enrollment Center and then down to the Technology Sciences Building, and then back over towards Cultural Sciences. The size of the stockaded area uh, that surrounds uh, the Great Plaza is almost equivalent to the size of MCC's campus, perhaps just a little bit larger. This is a profile view of an excavation into Monk's Mound, so we can see the stratigraphy, the layers of soils that compose the mound. And you can see towards the bottom these lenses of different soil types, some yellow, some dark brown, some a lighter brown. And each of these different lenses represents a single basket load of earth carried by a laborer from the source of the soil to be deposited on the mound. The co-occurrence of these different lenses of soils of different types indicates that there were multiple task groups at work on the construction of the mound, and each of these task groups was obtaining their soil from different areas. Towards the top of the stratigraphy, just above the uppermost horizontal yellow line, is a layer of bluish colored clay. And this special bluish clay was used to finish the surfaces. And it may have been chosen because of its distinctive color. There are some other areas within Monk's Mound and other mounds within Cahokia where a very distinctive white clay has been used to finish the surfaces. And this white clay is known to have come from an area in southern Indiana transported several hundred miles to be used at Monk's Mound. This would suggest the possibility that some of the other 
different types of soils that are used in the construction of the mound's interiors may come from different areas and may actually represent the areas where the workers came from. So they are incorporating a piece of their home into the construction of the mound. The mound is part of themselves. Now when the mound was constructed, approximately 21 million cubic feet of earth were used in its construction. To visualize a cubic foot of earth, think about a bag of manure that you may buy at Home Depot and spread on your yard in the spring or the fall in order to fertilize your grass. Those are usually one and a half cubic feet. So you would need several million bags of manure in order to build one of these. You also, if you have done yard work, might think about the weight of that, and having to transport uh, the soil, perhaps a great distance, uh, to pile it up on top of the mound. So in addition to the differences in the way that the mounds were used, there were also differences in the way that mounds were built. Remember that during the Mississippian period, the mounds were constructed as a model of the cosmos. They reconstructed the nature of the universe with dark soils at the bottom that represented the underworld realm, the center where the bodies were buried representing the earth upon which we humans live, and then a gravelly layer capping the mound construction representing the stony vault of the sky above and the dimensions beyond. Instead, Mississippian mounds have this more jumbled stratigraphy, and it's possible that the different types of soil, rather than representing different portions of the universe, represent different portions of the social and political world uh, of the community that contributed to the construction of the mound. Here we just have a review of the way that woodland mounds reconstructed the cosmos. And in the previous photograph, you could see that dark, mucky layer at the bottom, a central area uh, that made up the primary mound, and then a curving, gravelly layer that made up that final deposit before it was capped with soils to create the final mound construction. And each of these was very symbolically important in creating a model of the way the universe was constructed. So during the woodland period, everyone was buried together in the mounds. During the Mississippian period, only the ruling elite were buried in mounds. During the woodland period, some people may have been afforded more elaborate treatment with different and more exotic materials used in the offerings, but everyone was treated specially, and everyone was buried together. In the Mississippian period, there are great differences in the offerings and the treatment of individuals based upon their lo location in proximity to a mound. Are they within a mound? Are they next to the mound? Are they in a cemetery that is far away from the mound? In the woodland period, the differences seem to be primarily based on age, gender, and status that was achieved by that individual in their lifetime. However, in the Mississippian period, these differences seem to be based on ascribed status. You are born with differential access to wealth and power. Some people are born more powerful than others. In Mississippian society, religion and ritual were used to reinforce political power. Here we see an artist's reconstruction of a ceremony going on on top of a mound with the community below assembled to view it, or perhaps assembled to watch a game of lacrosse that is being played in the plaza below. But warrior priests drawn from the community elite, the chief, his relatives, wear and bear ceremonial regalia that allows them to personify mythic heroes, to become these deities and these cultural heroes and perform rituals to benefit the entire community, to bring the protection of the supernatural, to bring good weather, to keep the population healthy and free of illness. So what to remember? The introduction of maize agriculture transformed the societies of the eastern woodlands. Maize was much more productive than the indigenous small-seeded domesticates that had been cultivated by earlier woodland populations. 
Maize allowed the production of surpluses and fueled population growth, which provided the foundations for the emergence of social inequality. With population growth, there was a shift from small, dispersed homesteads to large, densely inhabited villages. There was also a reduction in house size, which also suggests change in the size of the fundamental social unit, from a large, extended family to a smaller, nuclear family, perhaps. Emergence of social inequality is indicated by several lines of evidence, including differences in residences from mound-top residences to those that are directly associated with mounds but not on top of them to those that are nowhere near the mounds. There's also differential distribution of resources, also related to a proximity from the mound, that those who are living on top of or near mounds have greater access to certain high-value subsistence goods and greater access to trade goods and exotic raw materials. And there are also differences in burial treatment. Only the elite are buried within the mounds, with fancy objects made from exotic raw materials and associated ritual paraphernalia, whereas commoners are buried with little, or in most cases, nothing. And there is a change in mound use from the earlier woodland period. During the woodland period, mound use was communal, Everyone was buried within the mounds. The axis mundi that the mound represented, the connection between the earth humans live upon and other dimensions of the universe, the upper world above and the underworld below, was accessible to everyone. During the Mississippian period, the axis mundi comes to be monopolized by the chiefly elite. They take control of the mounds. They elevate their houses on top of them. They are the only ones who are buried within them. And this shows their differentiation from the vast majority of the communities that they now rule over.